alligator men from Sanibel, refuge biologist Charles LaBeouf, and uh, city councilman Mark Westall will be speaking to us. He'll talk about the life biology of alligators and the human study of alligators and a little about the relationship of human beings to alligators. We uh, were very concerned at the, the refuge. Last year at this time, we were continuing to see many of the visitors get reasonably close, very close in some cases, to uh, the alligators that make the end of wildlife drive their home. So we did a study. We spied, watched, observed uh, about 4,500 visitors. And we found that uh, somewhere between 15 and 20 percent of the visitors were getting within about 10 to 12 feet of alligators. That's quite a few people. In addition, we found that almost 50 people threw things at alligators. Four of those people threw food. Uh, very severe threat to the rest of us and very uh, important uh, behavior for us to modify. The refuge is going to restructure the end of wildlife drive in the near future. We decided that one of the most important approaches that we take was through education. And so when we discovered the theme of uh, wildlife we to be predators, uh, this topic surfaced for the uh, midweek program. The um, alligators are very controversial this year because the state is, is watching Sanibel watching how alligators are managed here. And uh, tonight, I look with particular interest to hear what these two gentlemen think will be the future of the uh, alligator management program. We'll start with a look at the life biology and some colorful history of human interaction with alligators from wildlife biologist Charles LaBeouf. Charles. for that fine introduction. I'm very pleased to see such a turnout tonight. We thought at first we would have the, tonight's presentation held in the old part of the community house, but we found out later that we could hold it here in the main room. A little anecdotal point of information about tonight's program. Several months, Doug came to me at work and asked if I would participate in a program on the alligator's role as a predator, especially as it relates here to Sanibel Captiva. And he said he would ask Bird Westall if he would assist and participate in tonight's program too. And knowing Bird is very busy and has so many different avenues that he's working in today, I thought, well, Bird won't do it, so I'll agree. Bird surprised me, he agreed, and here I am. This is the first public presentation that I've made on American alligators, or prophet pigeons, in about 21 years, having specialized in, in sea turtles for, for so long. Back in the old days, 25, even 30 years ago, I would work with alligators in the spring and fall, and then concentrate on loggerhead turtles in the summertime. So for about eight months of the year, my life was very busy working with one type of reptilian form or another. And it's been about 30 years since I first talked about American alligators here in the Sanibel Community House. So it's sort of nice to be back in and speaking to such a large, large turnout of interested people. My personal involvement with alligators goes back now some 37 years. And at this point, I would like to make just one introduction and introduce to you my longtime friend, chairman of the, the city's wildlife committee, and who used to go in the field with me when I was just about, I guess, about 16, and he was about 20. I won't 
given the ages away, and study American alligators in the field. Ralph, will you stand up? Ralph Curtis. <laughs> Ralph and I worked with American alligators and American crocodiles almost daily back in the early 50s. Back in those days, Ralph was employed at the Everglades Wonder Gardens, and I was still in high school, and I worked there on weekends. So our involvement was not just in studying these animals in the wild, but also working with them, trying to uh, <coughs> increase productivity in a, in a captive hatching program with American crocodiles, handling these animals from tiny nine-inch hatchlings up to 13 and 14-foot adults. Back in about 1956, I did a cooperative study with the Florida Game and Freshwater Fish Commission in Collier County. I was living in Naples at the time. And about the latter part of 1956, I began to, to study alligators with a little bit more intensity and started a tagging program to better comprehend their life history. The basic life history of alligators was literally unknown in South Florida because most of the alligator work in the animal's life history had been conducted primarily in Louisiana. So the Florida population, especially the South Florida population, its unique life cycle and other aspects of the, the animal's uh, natural ecology were completely unknown. So from 1956 until 1958, I tagged some 1,500 alligators, physically handled these animals, all size classes, and attached tags to them to, to better comprehend, especially the movements, growth rates, things like this that were virtually unknown. And then in 1958, I came to Sanibel, and here I had a really unique situation because I had a concentrated cell, an insular population of alligators that was separated from the main population, being separated, of course, by the Gulf of Mexico, and also by the waters of Pine Island Sound and San Carlos Bay. So I began to apply tags to alligators and learn some interesting aspects about the animal, things that I'll touch on a little bit later on, but how they, they do interact with the marine system and how they are a very important predator in the role of the basic and fundamental ecology of Sanibel, both uh, years ago, historic and up until modern times. In 1967, I began to spend more of my time with loggerhead turtles. And I passed the baton, if you will, of alligator studies on to individuals like George Weymouth, George Campbell, both authorities on the subject. And then it has gone from the basic tagging life history studies up into a more of a comprehensive program to, to meet with the present status of the animal on Sanibel and the interaction of the animal with people, which is a very critical situation for the animal, and I'm sure that Bird will touch on that a little bit later on. Crocodilians, and an alligator is a crocodilian, are not modern-day dinosaurs. They are, however, the last of the ruling reptiles. Depending on your view in taxonomy, there are somewhere between 25 and 27 different species of Crocodilians. Crocodilians are the alligator, which is found only in the United States, and another species is found in China. The caiman, which is an alligator, alligator like crocodilian, is found in South America. The crocodiles are distributed in both eastern and western hemispheres, and both north and southern hemispheres, represented by one species in North America, the American crocodile. The fourth member of the group is called a gavial, or a gharil. It's found primarily in Asia, India, parts of southern China. The crocodilians as a whole date back some 137 million years. They, as I said, they were not, not dinosaurs. They were a stem reptile that broke apart from the basic dinosaur stock and evolved through time over the past 137 million years to the 25 to 26 modern species that we have. And they have an excellent fossil record. Their, their record is, is much clearer, much more presentable to the paleontologist than the dinosaur lineage. The alligators in North America, the American alligator, 
is today, or its historical range, occurred from, I'll draw a map here for you, occurred from southern Virginia down to Florida, westward to the Rio Grande Valley of Texas, north to Oklahoma, Arkansas, and then it sort of split in a straight line, the southern tier of Alabama, Mississippi, and Georgia. And today, remnants of the American alligator population, although depleted in many parts of its range, still occur within that respective perimeter that I described. Alligators and crocodiles are reptiles. They breathe air the same as we do. They are cold-blooded, if you will. They do not have any fundamental way to regulate their body temperature. So crocodilians are always observed, especially here on the island. If you're familiar with them, you'll see them out basking in the sunlight on canal banks or along the wildlife drive in the refuge, trying to increase their, their body temperature, to increase metabolism, to increase food intake, and to increase growth, and to reproduce. Those are the basic elements of, of basking, trying to regulate that temperature. Alligators and crocodiles are very distinct from other reptiles and amphibians. Crocodilians have four-chambered hearts. The others have three-chambered hearts. The alligator is unique in that it is not, it's looked upon by some, some people as an amphibian. It's not an amphibian, it's a reptile. People view it as being an amphibian because it lives part of its life in the water and part of its land, but that's not the classification for an amphibian. An amphibian basically starts in a larval stage, goes through a metamorphosis, turns into an adult in, in later time. But reptiles are either hatched or born alive, do not go through a larval stage and progress in time to an adult. Depending on the species, it depends on what, what size they attain. Alligators are specialized in that they have no protrudable tongue, as mammals do, and snakes and some lizards, and a few turtles. Their tongue is basically sealed to the base of the mouth, and during periods when the animal is submerged, the tongue will seal off the throat so the alligator can open his mouth with no penetration of water into the esophagus or the trachea. They also have the ability to specialize nostrils that are at the extreme end of the snout, have slit-like valves that can close or seal the nostrils to prevent water from passing into the respiratory system at the time the mouth is, same time as the mouth is being opened. And they also have specialized air flaps that seal the water. So the alligator, when he's in his element, when he's submerged, he's totally non-permeable to water. He will stock his prey with no water passing into, into his body. When submerged, the alligator uses, and with very considerable importance to his lifestyle, a third eyelid. It's known as a nictitating membrane. We have the remnants of that in our eye orbit, our eye, our eye socket. When the alligator is submerged, the nictitating membrane, which is transparent, comes across the eye, preventing any, any damage to the pupil or the cornea. Their eyesight is relatively good. You may walk up fairly close to one and he sort of blinks, but he can tell, he can tell what he's doing. And there's some data that indicates that crocodilians are color perceptive, that they can actually see, see color. <coughs> The alligators are also, crocodilians are also different than other reptilian forms because they have socketed teeth. Other reptiles and amphibians do not have teeth that grow from sockets within the bony part of the jawbone. Jaw, jaw and later on, when you get a chance uh, after the program, we have a large alligator skull up here. You can walk up and get a close look at it and see how the specialized teeth are fitted into the, the sockets. <coughs> If an alligator or a crocodile loses a tooth, another tooth is growing beneath it, and in time will fill the gap and fill the space voided by the, the tooth that uh, fell out. Alligators and crocodiles reproduce by sexual reproduction. The male mounts the female. There is a penis that becomes erect that enters the female, and fertilization is internal. They lay eggs. And some crocodilians show varying degrees of nest protection, as do some individual alligators. 
Back in 1957, I published a paper on the nest protection that was afforded to their nests by female alligators, and I find, found a wide degree of assistance that these alligators gave to their developing, developing eggs. Some alligators sort of ignore them, they stay in the water adjacent to the nest, and don't do anything, at least anything visible, that would give you the, the impression that they were protecting their nest. However, another alligator a few hundred yards down the canal bank, when you approach its nest, it becomes very aggressive, it charges under the water with its mouth wide open and a loud <laughs> trying to drive you away. Very, very awesome. And it still frightens me when it happens, and I'm sure a bird has, has a twinge of uh, fear now and then. <clears throat> Nonetheless, as a whole, we might say that most alligators do protect their developing eggs. And if you find an alligator nest, and if you can recognize it, please stay, you know, stay a considerable distance away, because if that particular individual is a protecting parent, it can certainly become very aggressive. The alligators are mound builders. They build nest mounds out of vegetation. They take cattail and spartina and submerge in aquatic plants in their mouth and they crawl up on the bank or in a tussock of spartina, any place where there's a, a high, dry elevation. And usually at night, they construct these large mounds that may be up, oh, three feet high in a large nest and could be seven, even eight feet in diameter in a large female. <clears throat> the average size of a female alligator on Sanibel is somewhere about eight feet, and there are, are reports of alligators occurring on Sanibel that were 14 feet long. That's a little bit beyond the maximum length that anyone has ever documented or measured here, but it is feasible because alligators have been recorded that measured 19 feet 4 inches. Many of us working with alligators or have worked with alligators don't necessarily accept that 19 foot 4 inch measurement. Just as a point of information, that was taken and published by the man who developed Tabasco sauce, <laughs> Mickelhenny from Avery Island, Louisiana. But in many documents and much of the literature, Mickelhenny's record still stands as 19 feet 4 inches. But it is somewhat skeptical. You can go either way or the other. You can disregard it or you can accept it. <coughs> Excuse me. The clot size of the alligator ranges between 20 and 70 eggs. Most of the, the nests that I've encountered here on Sanibel have been less than two dozen. They're a hard, brittle, calcified shell. They're elongated. Didn't bring an egg, did you by any chance, Bert? I guess not. Okay, good. I don't have any graphics in my presentation, just an alligator skull. It's about the size of a goose egg. As I said, it's hard and calcified, and the female will construct this mound, open up the, the top or the lateral side of the top, position her body in place, and deposit her eggs rather slowly over a period of perhaps an hour, perhaps two hours, depending on the clutch size, depending on whether it's a, a neonate animal the first time she's breeding, or other factors. When she's completed laying all the eggs that she'll deposit in this nest, she then covers it up and basically goes back into the water, goes through her everyday lifestyle, and perhaps protecting that nest. And recently it's been found, it's very interesting, that the, the maternal instinct of crocodilians is quite unique. It even approaches some mammals, and it's probably almost as good as some mammalian, or at least some bird of, of maternal caring for the young. When the young alligators are about to, when they've gone through their their developmental process, about 60 days, they start making noises inside the egg. Bird can probably do that. I'm out of practice. Very muted down inside the vegetation. So the, the mother then knows that it's time to release the hatchlings and she will go up to the nest, scrape away, break away the top, top of the nest. And if the, the hatchlings have pipped the egg, if they've broken through the egg shell, they're there, assembled, trying to get out of the nest. And there has been some excellent photography done showing not only the American alligator, but also some cro crocodiles that literally, very gently and gingerly, will pick up 
this little nine or ten inch hatchling, depending on the species, pick it up, maybe two of them, and carry them down to the water and let them swim from beneath her powerful jaws. Very, very unique. And this is only some of the new things that are coming to light on the alligator's life history because of the interest in alligators today. The alligator is the reason we're here tonight to celebrate the, the role that predators have in the scheme of things, in the natural order of things. And as I said, the alligator is a primary predator of the terrestrial or freshwater aquatic animals that we have in Florida. It's the most highest, it's the highest elevated. The only thing that probably could compete with it on an equal footing would be some large predaceous pelagic shark that's swimming along shore Sanibel now. The alligator is a dynamic personality, it's a dynamic animal, it's extremely powerful. However, it fits well into its role as a predator. And when I'm talking about predator, I'm, I'm not speaking of any interaction between alligator and man. Don't misunderstand me. The alligator is not a predator of human beings. The alligator is a caring predator. It kills what it eats. It's not a wanton taker of animals, like the raccoons that walk these beaches in the summertime and just for the fun of it bite off the heads of loggerhead turtle hatchlings and don't eat them. I'm going to get off on loggerheads here if I'm not careful. <laughs> so what I'm trying to say is that the alligator has been, has been somewhat esteemed for its role as a predator. But don't misunderstand its role. It's not here to be a problem to the human population. It does interesting things in its predatory fashion. It captures and consumes diseased animals, keeping disease down. It patrols bird rookeries in freshwater areas, like uh, certain separated areas of land within the Sanibel River system where white ibis and hingas and other colonial birds nest. It prevents trespass of other invading predators from reaching the nesting colonies by constantly swimming around the canals. If a raccoon tries to go across one of these canals to climb a tree and take down a young anhinga, the chances of it safely going from one bank to the other are almost nil if an alligator is present to do its, to do its role as a primary predator. The alligator has other roles too. Its roles are not as important today on Sanibel as it was historically. But years ago, before Sanibel was developed, before the Sanibel River was channelized, there were very few permanent bodies of water. In other words, the, the Sanibel River would dry, there would be some isolated pools of water that were maintained and kept open by an alligator population. Alligators get in these low areas. As the water dries, they actually physically excavate the area, widening it, deepening it, trying to maintain a water level, which number one will, will keep them wet because moisture is required in their, in their system. It will also ensure not from the alligator's personal standpoint, but it also ensures that other forms of life, tiny fishes, amphibians, snakes, water birds, all have a permanent reservoir of water to carry them through the dry season. And this is what the alligator was doing here. When I came here to live permanently 30 years ago, a few months ago, we only had a few permanent bodies of water. Over here behind Sundial, the long canal that runs sort of around Beach View Country Club. Some folks call it the Panama Canal. But about where that canal turns was a little beautiful buttonwood enclosed pond called Fitzhugh Pond. Permanent alligators stayed in that population. And down by Gulfside City Park, we had the Perry Track, which was, was another rather fresh seasonally. It became quite salt sometimes. It had a permanent population of alligators. And up off of Gulf Drive, up where the rocks is now, there was also a permanent body of water. When I say permanent, 
The only reason these pools were permanent is because alligator populations were keeping them permanent. Had the alligators not been there, there would have been no fresh water source for the other wildlife forms. And here and there throughout the, the island were these permanent water systems. If you've been to the conservation center up on Santa Bob Capitiva Road, you have had the opportunity to see one of the very few natural pools or natural alligator holes that were maintained by alligators. I want to touch briefly on, on crocodiles. Many folks uh, view crocodiles as being something foreign. As I mentioned, we do have crocodiles in Florida. In the past uh, eight years, we have had at least two known individuals of crocodiles inhabiting parts of Sanibel. We had one in the refuge for a few years, and there was one up uh, at uh, Tahiti Shores, up off between San Cap Road and the Gulf of Mexico. But crocodiles were never very common in Florida. Florida is just the periphery of the range, as the same species occurs from southern Florida down to Ecuador. So southern Florida was just the northern extremity of this animal's range. Alligators are fresh water. However, we know that nightly alligators go from freshwater cells in the refuge, cross the dike, go into the saltwater tidal areas. And in the summertime, it's not uncommon at all in July, August, and September, while I'm out on the beach working with loggerhead turtles to see three or four sizable alligators a night that have come from the flooded ponds and, and areas of the Sanibel River. They've walked out on all fours, they've come across the Gulf Beach Ridge onto the beach and entered the Gulf of Mexico to, to feed primarily on fish. Things like, uh, that, like mullet that are so often very common very close to shore or perhaps even, even crabs that are found in those very close inshore waters. Crocodiles, on the other hand, prefer salt water. And one of the distinguishing points between the two, why the alligator cannot stay in salt water and the crocodile can, is because the crocodile has a better developed salt gland or a lacrimal gland located in the eye that as salt water is taken into its system, it's wasted as tears, salty tears through the eye. And the alligator doesn't possess the same levels of sophistication in the salt glands, so therefore its cells begin to dehydrate and dry, and in time, if it's allowed to remain continuously in salt water, it will succumb because of the, the requirements of its body's osmal regulation are not the same as that in the crocodile. But it's not uncommon at all to see alligators in the, in the Gulf of Mexico. It doesn't excite me at all when someone calls me and tells me there's a, a six-foot alligator in front of Island Inn because it's common. I expect it to happen, and I'm sure as long as there's alligators on Sanibel, they'll go from fresh to salt occasionally. I wanted to point on just a, a few things. Bert said, or Doug said I would talk about some of the the other aspects, uh, historical aspects of alligators. Back in the, in the late 50s, Sanibel was relatively known for its alligators. We had a few, but they were primarily in these permanent bodies of water. And then as the, the channelization of the Sanibel Slough started from down by the uh, Chevron gas station and progressed westward, as these areas were excavated, and alligators, of course, moved the young alligators that are not basically territorial or males in season, found these new areas to reside in. So they moved into the Sanibel River. And as the Sanibel River was enlarged, then more wildlife forms were utilizing it for food for alligators, better distributed through the island, less pressures by their predators. Alligators have predators too. So the alligator population basically increased. And back in the, in the late 50s, early 60s, we had a, a growing, I believe, a much more rapidly growing population of alligators than we do today. We would find more nests, we would find evidence of more hatchlings. <coughs> so the population back in those days was increasing. And it was rather interesting as the alligator populations of the mainland group 
poaching became rather profitable. Alligator hides back in the early 60s were going for like $25 to $35 a foot. That's a, back in the 60s, that was a relatively good piece of, of pocket change. And we had a few residents on the island. Most of them have died or moved off the island that would periodically get money, spending money, by going out and killing a few alligators. It was not uncommon to hear gunshots at night on Sanibel. Most of these gunshots were people actively alligator hunting. Back in those days, <clears throat> there were only three people on the island that had law enforcement authority. We had a part-time deputy sheriff. Tommy Wood, the first refuge manager, and I had federal commissions, but we also had state commissions that gave us the same authority as a Florida wildlife officer. So it was up, us, up to us to uh, sort of keep tabs on what was happening with wildlife here in the island. And it was not uncommon at all to get called out at night to hear someone say someone's shooting over here and, and we'd get out and we'd try to catch them, but we could never apprehend them. And then back about 1968, have you all been to the Bailey Track on Santa Fe? walk through the nice trails. Well, the airplane canal on the southern end of the belly track is called the airplane canal because back in those days we kept a, a Cessna seaplane there. And we would land and take off in that very narrow canal. We also had some of our equipment there. We had a, a borrowed canoe, a 17-foot Grumman canoe. And one night that canoe came up missing. And we couldn't find it. We tried to do a little bit, bit of investigation, trying to see what happened to the canoe, but it had disappeared. And a few weeks later, I happened to be uh, helping a, a, an Audubon group that was here, and we had uh, picked up some canoes, and we were canoeing the Sanibel River from Tarpon Bay Road East. We got down there and went around a few bends, and suddenly I saw a large group of turkey and black vultures lift up, hundreds of them, come up out of the butt of this crash bang, get airborne. So I pulled off in one of these little tributary canals, and here on the bank on both sides, underneath a very dense buttonwood strand, of sapling buttonwoods actually, because the river hadn't really, the vegetation really hadn't recovered when the river was excavated. So the trees were just now getting where they did give a little bit of protection from aerial observation. And there on the bank, scattered out by the vultures, I collected and piled up the skulls of 43 alligators that had been butchered <coughs> or skinned. People, the people that killed alligators back in those days didn't eat them. They didn't take time. Eating alligators was done, but it's sort of become a fad in the past decade in restaurants for people to go in and taste alligator meat as, a, as just something new in their life. But they generally weren't eaten by people that killed them because they didn't have time. They had to skin the alligator, get it rolled up, and get out of here before they were caught. Well, getting back to my story, the alligators, uh, as far as I know, the remains are still there. It's pretty well grown up now. But I proceeded on a little bit further, and then in the next lateral canal, I saw something sticking up, and lo and behold, here was our stolen canoe, completely, completely sunk down. A few nights later, I found, a few days later, I found six carcasses on the airplane canal down at the very end, the very west end. So we weren't doing much good in catching these, and so we decided we'd call in the state. And this sort of amu amuses me, looking, looking at how things have changed. We had a definite problem. We had evidence of X number of alligators being, being destroyed. So we called in the, the state wildlife officer, who is still, still employed, I believe, as a wildlife officer. And they basically refused to come to Santa Fe. They didn't want to come over here. They were too busy. Today, we can't keep the state out of our alligator program. <laughs> I don't know what's happened. It may be a new political scenario happening in Tallahassee, who knows, but they are sure basically getting involved in the alligators. But poaching was, was very profitable, and it went on from time to time. And through the grapevine, we, we sort of feel that uh, those 43 alligators that were taken illicitly were not taken by, by local people. It was just probably too, too large an operation. 
And even though they were poachers, they still respected us. They didn't, uh, they didn't try to trick us. They didn't try to uh, cause us any real, real harm, other than take an occasional alligator. Well, I think I've talked over my, my 20 minutes. And uh, I'll respond to any questions on, on the aspects that I've covered after the second half of the program. The next speaker is well known to, to all of us. He's involved very heavily in protection and conservation and scientific research into the population of osprey that occur here on Sanibel. He's the founder and project director of the International Osprey Foundation. He's also a leader, a community leader, now serving on the Sanibel City Council. But Bird, you're also a follower. You followed me in the alligator field. You followed me on the city council. Now you're following me on the alligator program. <laughs> Bird Weston. After that comment, I'll have to raise this up because it's too short. <laughs> Thanks, Charles. Um, Charles started out with a little anecdote night uh, talking about that uh, he said he would go ahead and do it because I'm so busy that uh, with all the diff different projects that I'm involved with that he figured, oh, I, I wouldn't uh, agree to do this for Doug because I'd just be too busy. Uh, I, feel like, I felt like saying, almost stood up and yelled it out, uh, Charles, haven't you learned the reason why I agreed to do this because I haven't learned how to say no yet. That's the problem. Okay, um, I've got some slides here. Now, I, actually, the slides I've got are kind of split up into two different groups. Uh, there's a first half, which is basically going to go over a lot of the stuff that Charles uh, has already gone through. So this is to put something up on the screen that maybe you can get an idea as to what Charles was talking about a little bit. Uh, the, uh, the other part, the second half, is mostly just a kind of a series of, of uh, of slide. What I'm going to try and do is see if I can get a little bit of freedom here so I can see the slides myself. See if we can get moved around here. Okay. Uh, so it's of us catching an alligator. Maybe what I ought to do before we finally turn off all the lights, I'm going to have, since Charles had somebody stand up, I'm going to have somebody stand up. She's going to hate me for it. But uh, Yep, she's already shaking her head. I want Janie Westall, my wife, to stand up. Go on, stand up. <laughs> I've been trying for several years to get the media a little bit interested in doing something about her because I think she's one of the few ladies in the state that goes around and wrestles alligators. Whenever I get an alligator call and I have to go out, that lady out there goes along right along with me. And actually, I use her to a certain degree because I'll get the rope around the head of the alligator and then the first thing I do, of course we've attracted a crowd, you know, just like today, we all we have to do is a little advertising, we've got a full room. But you get an alligator out there, somebody's going to deal with it, I get that rope around the head and I go, here Janie, take the rope. And everybody standing there goes, <gasps> they can't believe a woman can handle an alligator. Well, maybe let's say it can be done and she does it all the time and she helps me. Uh, I think she'd been on the island about probably maybe two or three months, no more than that, and we had to had to move an alligator, and she went right out there and got slapped around by the alligator's tail, and the police officers couldn't believe this lady was doing this. At any rate, so I wouldn't be able to do a lot of stuff that I do if it wasn't for her help. Okay, um, one more important thing. You go ahead and turn the, or are we just going to show it like this? Yeah. Okay, you might need to make it a little bit darker. I don't know if we're going to be able to see everything. These slides don't belong to me. Uh, I've got a few slides, but mostly when I go out and do the work, I tend to uh, do it. Don't worry about taking pictures. Uh, Janie takes a few pictures every once in a while, but all these slides belong to a lady whose name is Jenny Mead. She's our next door neighbor. She's quite a naturalist and educator herself. Uh, she teaches a, a shelling class here on the island. She's really quite knowledgeable. She's in the process of putting some slides together. She's followed me to catch a few alligators every once in a while. She's putting a program together so that mostly uh, she can educate people up in Maine. But I, after looking through the slides that she's got, and I went through, 
I said, uh, you better be real careful or I'm going to get you giving alligator programs down here on Sanibel. Because needless to say, educational programs about alligators is really very important down here because I think education is the only way we're going to continue to uh, allow the alligator to survive. That's good, Doc. Right there, I think. Uh, so I just went through a bunch of slides. She's got them kind of lined up in, in better order maybe than what I've got them. But I went through uh, and picked out the slides that uh, kind of fit in what I wanted to show. Uh, this slide is, is uh, needless to say, about what Charles was talking about at the very beginning. Uh, cro crocodilians go back a long way. I'm certainly glad we don't have to deal with any alligators or crocodiles that are this large anymore. And he, he mentioned the, the caimans, which really aren't set up in this, but this shows the, especially the two on the left, people are always talking about how you tell the difference between an alligator and a crocodile. There's a couple of different ways that you can tell, but probably the most obvious way is the crocodile has a very narrow snout and the alligator has a much broader snout. And as Charles mentioned, that kind of gives you a graphic of where they're located throughout the uh, area, throughout the states. Notice the broad snout uh, of the alligator and the more narrow snout. This is an American crocodile. The picture was taken down in the Keys. I tend to think crocodiles just look a little bit more vicious. And that's generally. Younger alligators don't look that bad, but there are a couple of big old alligators around here that have real gnarly teeth and look very vicious. But they, generally, the American crocodile just looks a little bit uh, more like a dinosaur with the big scoots on his tail and his back. He just looks a lot meaner. He shows a lot more teeth usually. But uh, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of crocodiles around here. I wish we did. We've had them visit here every once in a while. But they don't stay here. Uh, lots of times people will say, how in the world do you tell a size? It's always amazing. Uh, and this is something my wife and I always go against. We'll see an alligator, and I probably tend to overreact to try and make it not appear to be as large as it is. And yet, uh, the general public always tends to say it's a lot larger than it really is. Uh, you know, when somebody calls up and says, oh my God, there's a 14-foot alligator out in my driveway. Well, I figure it's probably around 8 feet. <laughs> okay, there's a general estimate that you can make. Because lots of times all you can see on the alligator is the head sitting in the water or something. If you can give an estimate from the distance between the eyes and the nose, the snout, in inches, then you've got an idea about how long he is in feet. Now what's interesting about that is sometimes, like the other day we had an alligator run over up on the Sandcap Road at the Wagram Curve area where the American Legion is, and this alligator had, which he had a 12 foot head. I mean, in other words, he had a head that was about 12 inches and he should have been a 12 foot alligator, but he only turned out to be somewhere around 10 feet. So he probably hadn't eaten quite as well as he should have. Now, this is the way a lot of people end up seeing alligators. They go to some place like Bush Gardens or some uh, roadside zoo somewhere, and those alligators sit around all day long and eat. And uh, I don't know how often they get fed, but obviously they get fed too much. That's the unfortunate thing about alligators. They are basically lazy creatures and they don't mind sitting somewhere, not moving, as long as they're kept warm, as long as nobody bothers them, and as long as somebody feeds them at the right time, they're going to just sit there and just take it easy. So look at this guy, he's so uh, uh, obese, he gets, he gets real fat jaws, he gets real, I mean, it looks like he's a balloon that somebody's blown up. But this is a situation that hopefully none of you will ever come across where you end up being in a face-to-face -face situation where they will puff themselves up. There's, you know, and I don't know if it's, if it's some sort of macho thing in me or whatever, but I must admit, when I have to deal with an alligator that's up on the land and I'm trying to get him to move, you know, out of the driveway and get back to the pond, and he turns himself around and whips that tail around and starts hissing like, like Charles mentioned there uh, and gave you a very good example of it, you know, you, you get cold chills up your back, but it's really impressive to see a big animal just rear up like that. I have to tell one story. I'm going to show some pictures here of an alligator nest in a little bit. But there was one time when I was on a canoe trip, 
and there was about, this alligator was right around six feet, maybe seven foot, and I knew this alligator really well. You get to the point where you learn the various alligators in different places on, on the river when I go on the canoe trips. And this particular female, Charles was talking about how some alligators are very aggressive around the nest and some alligators will let you get away with things. Well, I'd known this alligator since she was about four foot long and she had raised young in other years and uh, I would go in there in the summer and have a canoe trip and the young would be hatched out and I'd go over and pick up the young and this female alligator would start swimming over at us uh, in the canoe and I would all I have to do is sit there and stare at her and she'd stop dead in the water and then turn around and go back. So I thought I knew this alligator really well. Well, one day we went in there and I had a husband and wife with me. The lady was up front, the husband was sitting in the middle and I was in the back. And we went by and we heard that little grunting sound going on from the bank. I looked over and there were a couple of babies right along the edge of the water. They still had the yolk sac attached to their belly. So I said, all right, they just hatched. I looked around, I couldn't see this female alligator anywhere. So I said, okay, I'm playing the great guy. I'll go over and pick up one of these baby alligators and let, let you know, these people get educated, see the cute little baby alligator. Well, the reason why I couldn't see the female was because she was laying submerged right next to the babies. Mm -hmm. And as I moved the canoe over closer and closer, I got about three feet away from the side of the bank, which is where the babies were. And she came charging up out of that water, roaring and hissing and trying to, well, she tr was trying to bite whatever she could get a hold of. I luckily pulled my paddle up out of the way, and she's, you know, lunging up, making a big splash, roaring, and just something like you'd see in a movie, you know. Well, I very quickly moved the canoe about 10 feet away. And she stayed in the water, and she's just hissing and cussing and everything else. I looked in the front of the canoe, and the lady, the, the husband, was in the, in the middle of the canoe, and he was looking, you know, the canoe was shaking and everything, and he's looking. But I looked over at the lady, she's staring off to the left somewhere, you know, way, not even looking at the others. I said, uh, excuse me, ma'am, this is great. Don't you, you know, what, what are you doing? What are you looking over there? The alligator's over here on the right. She goes, I'm not going to look at that alligator. I'm afraid if I do, it will attack again. <laughs> so, but let me mention that, you know, of course, I'm not, I would never suggest that anybody go out there and try and pick up the babies, and Charles is right. That is the time you have to be the most cautious around an alligator because that is when that maternal instinct overrides any natural fear she may have from you as a potential predator. We had another situation, this is how we work things out on Santa We had a situation where a guy went into the Brazilian pepper at the back of his yard to try and clear it out. He was trying to clear it out a little bit. Next thing he knows, he hears this rumbling and this hissing as this alligator comes charging at him. It only went probably about three feet, but it, you know, three feet towards him. But it was enough to make him go very quickly the other way. But it was right in his backyard, and the re reason, actually it wasn't his backyard, it was, I think, his mother's and his aunt's in, uh, backyard, and I think both of them were somewhere in their 80s. And they didn't speak English, and it was a situation, I got a call from the city saying, will you come down and see if we can work out a problem? Because obviously there was a real potential problem here. But this guy was very understanding, and we actually borrowed some snow fence from the refuge. We put up some snow fence along the back of that property line. And it, actually, both parties then felt safer. The ladies didn't think that the alligator was going to come charging through the fence. And the alligator probably felt safer because it felt like nobody else was going to come into its backyard. There was an alligator nest in there. She hatched the young out of there, and then within about three days after the young hatch, she moved them about 200 yards further on down the, the uh, canal where she was, away from that property, and finished, you know, settled into that area. So there are ways that you can, what I'm going to get into here at the end, is there are ways that you can try and coexist, even in potentially dangerous situations. There are ways that we can work things out. Don't feel like, if you run into an alligator problem here on the island, don't feel like you're alone. There's going to be somebody that's going to try and help you out. Okay. Here's the alligator nest. Now, lots of times they're not right on the edge of the water like this one is. I wouldn't be surprised if this one uh, wasn't actually up on higher ground, maybe when it was first made, but uh, uh, it, maybe waters came up or something like that. Lots of times they're up on high ground. Around here, they tend to be made out of cattails an awful lot. So you get a thicker blade, maybe palm fronds, and that 
type of stuff thrown together. And there's, of course, a picture of the alligator charging the person taking the photograph. Now, as from here, that doesn't, doesn't look like you really see a lot of difference, but hopefully you can. The alligator egg is on the uh, right-hand side. And this is just a regular chicken egg on the left to give you a comparison between the two. I actually had this egg at home and I forgot to bring it, but it gives you, they're a little bit elongated. They uh, uh, can get a little bit pitted on one side. After the young hatch, they're, they're not very long, you know, eight, nine, ten inches, something like that. Notice the striping on them. That striping helps to camouflage them, and they really need to be camouflaged because. You know, people will ask you, well, how many eggs can an individual nest have? And as Charles mentioned, you know, what was it, 20 to 70? I usually say 30 to 60. And people will go, oh my God, no wonder we're being overrun by alligators. But you have to finish the statement. You have to ask yourself, well, out of those 30 or 60 or 20 or 70 or whatever, how many of those are going to survive to be adults? And maybe two or three to make it, will make it to be four feet long. Alli everything eats baby alligators. Fish, turtles, river runners, raccoons, ants will get into the nest. Other alligators will eat, eat the babies. As a matter of fact, I got a call the other day from Mike Klein because uh, he's one of our advisors that we have with the city. And he got a call from Signal Inn because the people were nervous. They like their adult alligators. They've got a couple of adult alligators that hang around at Signal Inn. But they had 15 baby alligators from two different years. Some of them were right around 12 inches and another batch was around uh, close to two foot. And they were going, oh my God, we're going to be overrun with alligators when, we, when they grow up. I don't have 15 six foot alligators running around all over the place. So I told them, I said, look, maybe we'll deal with it eventually, but go, why don't you go over and talk to the signal in people. I was talking to Mike. I said, why don't you go over there and, and let them understand that out of those, actually they're lucky they got 15 left, but by the time they get to be adults, they'll either disperse out or they'll be eaten by something else, and if they don't disperse out, the female will probably eat them. So he went over to talk to the signal in people, and right when he was explaining this to the people there, somebody came up and said, oh my God, the mother just ate a baby. <laughs> so, you know, that's why we're not going to be overrun with alligators. Everything eats the babies. Now, as Charles mentioned, they've got the teeth that there's always a tooth on the inside, so if they lose one, they'll get another one to come back in and take its place. Their eyes, are they've got fairly decent eyesight, about as good as ours. Kind of looks like a cat's eye. And you can see a bit of that nictating uh, membrane coming up there from the right-hand side in the corner there. Now, I, no. Okay, this is a scoot, what's known as a scoot. It's kind of a, a protective armor plating that they have on their back. That an alligator's hide is real tough on the back side. That's why the hunters, you know, the hide people are always going to take the bottom side. That's where all the good hide is. Back side's really tough. This is a bone that actually kind of floats on the back of the alligator. It's not really attached to any other bones. That scoot is over here. Let's see if I can get to it without tripping over the wires. You can't tell from the slide because it doesn't really look like it's that big of a deal. And you can come up and take a look at it later, but this is the, this is the, pick, the actual scoop. It's a good inch and a half, almost two inches wide. That came from, anybody remember the old alligator by the name of Marshall? He was a big old alligator, he used to live around here. Well, he finally died of natural causes. I was always afraid somebody was going to end up killing him because he was a little bit uh, pretty aggressive animal. I think people have fed him in the past. But anyway, he finally died, and uh, that's one of his scoops. Actually, Marshall was about the size that that alligator skull over there was, right around 12 foot. There, of course, is the back, and those, those little ridges along the back, yeah, that's, that's what the scoot is. And they have the scoots that go along the tail. This is the area, if you ever see an alligator that uh, uh, is walking through your yard or something like that, needless to say, don't get too close to him. But if, if he's been tagged by the city program, this is where he's going to be tagged. We, we have a various designation where uh, the people that are licensed 
to deal with these alligators, they have a mark where they will cut a scoot off. Then they, you know, whether it's the first, second, third, fourth, or fifth alligator they've caught, they uh, they have a on the other side, on the right hand side, they'll cut another scoot off, and then to designate that it's part of the city program, where the scoots all come together and then become just one row, uh, they'll cut off the third scoot, the third rib, the third scoot, uh, to designate designate that as part of the city program because. Charles used to catch a lot of alligators. George Weymouth used to go out, and I don't know, Charles, I don't know if you ever went with George very much, but George used to go out in the canoe and catch alligators, and I'm sure Charles used to do crazy things. I'm basically fairly chicken when it comes to alligators. I'm not going to go into the water. I'm not going to go diving in there with them. I'm not going to uh, go in a canoe, because you get a big alligator fucking around inside of a canoe, and I just soon not mess with it. But George Weymouth used to go around and catch a lot of alligators. A lot of them were pretty small that he caught. But he'd go out and just tag them, just like Charles was doing back in the early days. Let's get you a view from the bottom, show you how the legs really don't get used very much when they swim. They keep those legs down, just trailing along behind them, and undulate their tail, and that's how they move through the water. As Charles mentioned, the alligators primarily eat fish. But as a predator, you know, I've always said that unfortunately, people find it very easy to be interested in creatures that are cute and cuddly. You know, it's much easier to get somebody interested in, in uh, making sure raccoons survive, but it's a lot more difficult to get people interested in keeping a, a creature that's ugly around. I've always said I wish there was a way we could uh, uh, find a way to put uh, bunny tails or rabbit ears on the back side of alligators and maybe we get people more interested in keeping the alligators around. But, you know, they get upset, they, oh, they'll eat that poor little turtle. And, uh, an alligator can put it somewhere around 2,000 pounds per square inch worth of pressure, so they have the capability to crush the turtle shell. But that is an important part of the function of a predator. They're supposed to eat things. Realize that Predators generally only catch the weak, or the sick, or the injured. Everyone, there's always that possibility there may be a bit of chance involved in that. You know, the, the prey may just be in the wrong spot at the wrong time. But generally speaking, they're going to only capture the sick or the weak, or the injured. That's why they're so important around the rookeries. Because those alligators, I tend to believe that the birds don't choose their nesting sites unless there's a big alligator down there in the water. So we need to keep those alligators around, otherwise we're going to lose the birds. That's an important point, because we get a lot of people moving on the island, see the cute little raccoons, and they're going, oh, isn't that great? I love wildlife. Then they see the alligator, and they go, oh, my God, there's a monster. And they don't understand, if we keep on working to save the raccoons, but not the alligators, we're going to lose the birds, which everybody loves. So it's important to realize that balance. At the very end of the wildlife drive, we've got some nice yellow crown night herons nesting at the very final loop. Why do you think those birds are so willing to nest so close to people right there? It's because they know you're not going to swim across that water to get into the nest. <laughs> Here's a situation where it's not necessarily a good picture, but uh, this is even an alligator grabbing hold of a rattlesnake. Now, I don't know if this was set up. I don't know where this picture came from. But I suppose alligators are opportunistic. They'll take hold, grab hold of anything they think they can get. Look at the snake trying to bite that alligator on the elbow. Now this is what people get upset with mostly. But realize we have an exploding population of raccoons here. The distemper that's going around, some of you may not know, some of you may, there's canine distemper going around the raccoon population. That's just another rule of nature trying to control over population levels. The alligators are important predators in protecting the birds. That's, I, and I can't stress that enough because, you know, this is a horrible looking picture. But unless that happened, we'd lose the birds. And I really don't think anybody wants to lose the birds. And here's an, an, an important lesson. We get a lot of people that will say, oh, we're going to be overrun with alligators. Well. Alligators are going to make sure that they never get to be too, too many on the island. Alligators control their own population levels, or at least they try to, kind of in the same way we do. As it's in their genes that they will hunt their own kind, and they will become aggressive at certain times. And uh, this happened a couple of times already this year. We've had a few alligators that ended up getting killed by another alligator. 
the, in case you can't figure out what it is, the surviving alligator is on the right, right side up, and the alligator that didn't make it, that's his belly, and his head's down here lower on the, on the bottom side. But how many times do you go on up to the refuge and you see the, the bird life particularly going just unbelievably close to the alligators? They tend to know how close they can come. And the healthy bird, the bird that is healthy and alert and aware, he's going to be able to keep just that respectable distance. Have you ever seen the films of the uh, wildebeest or the zebras out in Africa and the lions will be walking around the edge? They know how close they can let that lion come. And so both can coexist. And uh, uh, actually, there was one situation a couple of years ago where at the end of that, in that loop area again at the refuge, we had a mother with young, and this great egret kept on coming around. And I bet you anything, that great egret was wanting to eat one of those babies. But every time that great egret got too close, boy, this alligator would come charging up at it. And of course, everybody on the drive kept on wanting to, didn't know what to do. They wanted to scare away the bird. You got to sit there and let nature take its course. That's, that's what it's all about. Here's a picture of an alligator hole. I don't think it's here on the island. It looks, actually, it looks like those are wood storks in the, in the hole there. But that gives you a bit of an idea how the alligators will wallow out this little pond. And it's very important. Needless to say, there's an alligator in that pond. He's going to get a meal. But overall, the bird population and all the other creatures get to survive because He's providing water for them to live in during the drying periods. Now, as Charles mentioned, it's not quite as important on Sanibel anymore because we've dredged out the Sanibel River and we have the uh, development ponds all over the place. Remember how I said at the beginning, alligators are basically lazy? Why should an alligator spend all that time dredging out a pond and keeping some area excavated when all he's got to do is crawl into some development pond where the pond's probably like 10, 15 feet deep. It, it's going to have to be one pretty heavy duty drop for that pond to dry up. So he's just going to go in there. That's important because at this time of the year, we're in about the second year of a drought. We've got a lot of people moving into the subdivisions and you're going to hear the comment, my God, we're exploding with alligators. I've never seen so many alligators in my pond before. Your next question should be, how long have you lived here? Well, I've lived here for three years and I've never seen so many alligators. Each year during the end of the dry season, you're going to have alligators in the ponds. When the summer rains begin, those alligators are going to pick up and start dispersing out to the more wild areas. This is what Charles was talking about. This is part of the hunting that went on for a long time. Alligator populations started to decline. They actually became an endangered species because there was a strong fear that the alligator might eventually become extinct because of the hunting pressures that were there. Alligators, you know, there's this, they're, they're doing the hunt now in the state. There's a lot of pressure to hunt more. A lot of people feel macho going out and hunting these alligators. Alligators are easy animals to hunt. They're really not very bright. In Louisiana, they use uh, hook and bait and they capture them and, and it's done as a business. But as, in Florida, they had a situation where, uh, you know, the, the population was, was considered endangered. They, for a long time, and probably mostly because Florida didn't have that many people in it, the state said, all right, we don't want anybody hunting alligators down here. We don't want it. And they, for many years, moved the alligators around when they got up into somebody's neighborhood or somebody complained about them. But there wasn't a real problem. But you, get, you hear more and more about the alligator population exploding. And we've got to do something about the alligators. They're invading into the residential neighborhoods. Wrong. They probably lived in the swamp 10 years ago that was where that golf course is today. 1,400 approximately net. We have 1,400 people moving into the state every day. Imagine how many of those people have never had to put up with an alligator in the lake in their backyard. They've probably all seen Tarzan movies at one time, so they know how dangerous alligators are. They moved down from up north, look out in their lake in their backyard, and whoa, they have a dangerous animal out there. This is a residential neighborhood, get rid of that alligator. So what happens everywhere else but Sanibel, 
If an alligator is over four feet long and somebody complains about it, and he's considered to be a nuisance alligator, there's a pretty good chance that alligator may be killed. Now, what we've done here on Sanibel is we recognize that if we go under that policy, we're going to have to pretty much kill all the alligators on the island because even the refuge alligators will periodically cross over the San Cap Road and get into Chateau Sumer or Gulf Pines or some of the other waterways because the alligators will get up and move, especially during the dry season and especially at the beginning of the breeding season. What happens a lot around here is they end up in people's swimming pools. Now, a lot of what I'm all about is trying to get people to coexist with alligators. Now, coexisting does not mean that you have to sit around and wait until that alligator gets out of the swimming pool before you can take a dip. That's not what I'm talking about. You own that swimming pool or you're visiting here and you have access to that swimming pool, you should be able to use that swimming pool whenever you want to. So, I don't care what time it is, and unfortunately for me, it always seems to happen right at supper time or after 10.30 at night. I, I'm supposed to make sure I point out that if you do make a phone call, call the police department first. That's the number that everybody can get a hold of easily, and they'll be the ones that then, if, if they don't have anybody on duty that can handle it, they'll give me a call or something like that. Otherwise, you know, a lot of people will tend to call me up and say, oh, come on, Bert, come over here and take care of my situation. And I really am fairly busy, and the police department does a really good job of telling who goes, goes where. And we've got several, we have around 13 city employees that are licensed by the state, along with me, that I've trained, most of them police officers, that will deal with the alligator situation. So call the police department, don't call me up. Unless it's a real emergency type situation, you really need somebody, and you only know my number, you know, I'm not going to tell you, don't call me up. But here, here's the situation. I'll come over at any time and move that alligator out of there. Your end of the deal is, if I'm willing to drop my supper or get up out of bed or whatever to come over and get that alligator, when I catch that alligator and drag him to your backyard and let him go in the lake, don't come up to me and say, what the heck are you doing? That alligator's going to turn right around and crawl back out of that lake and get back into my swimming pool. This is a residential neighborhood. Take him to the Ding Darling Refuge. That's why we have the refuge here. Because I'm going to probably get a little bit mad at first, but I'm getting better at it. I tone down a little bit. I say, first of all, even if we killed that alligator, another alligator is going to come and take his place. You will always have alligators in the pond in your backyard or in the mosquito ditch along the side of your house or whatever. If you really want to keep the alligator out of your swimming pool, Put up a fence. You know, but people don't want to do that. They don't have to worry about that. Uh, I'll get people that will call up and say, well, I like to go for walks along the road at night in the summertime. My God, what if there's an alligator out there? He's going to attack me. I say, well, if you want to protect yourself from an alligator and you want to go for a walk at night, carry a flashlight. Because here's what will happen. If you walk down that road without a flashlight, the alligator will probably let you get within about three to ten feet before he hisses at you. And at which point, you have a heart attack. <laughs> I think I probably would if I didn't know that alligator was there. But if you've got a flashlight, you're walking down the street, you're shining it up, and about 50 feet away from you, you see these red eyes shining at you. <clears throat> Therefore, you don't have a heart attack. Now, if you feel like you have to, you can go back to your house and call the police department, and they'll get out get out the long poles, kick him in the butt a couple of times, and escort him on out of there. But there are ways that you can, uh, you know, take measures to protect yourself from the alligators, and it's really not that difficult. The other situation that we get lots of times, people will call up and say, this alligator comes and suns in my backyard every day, and I want you to come get rid of it. It's too dangerous. And I'll go to his backyard, and I'll say, well, what do you think? Why do you think this alligator comes up here? Because I look at their backyard and it's this nice, beautiful, sod lawn gently sloping down to the water. I said, you asked that alligator to come here in the sun. You need to let more vegetation grow up along the side. Take away his sunning spots. You, by clearing out your vegetation along the back side of your lot, you've asked that, edge, that alligator to come up into your backyard in the sun. 
And so, again, there are things. Now, I wouldn't tell people to plant buttonwoods along the backside because someday that buttonwood's going to grow up high enough. Maybe you can't see the water. That's the big problem. That's why people clear out the vegetation. But you can plant plants like leather fern, spartina, plants that will grow up a couple of feet or so, take away the sunning spot, and, uh, but not you know, take away your view of the lake. An alligator is basically lazy. He's not going to bushwhack a path through the vegetation to get up to a sunning spot because he knows that he's not safe in that sunning spot and if you approach him, he's going to have to bushwhack his way back through the vegetation to get to the safety of the water. Remember the Tarzan movies where the crocodiles would always make the mad dash to the water? You always see those films of the crocodiles diving into the water. That was a clear, easy access for the water and the reason why they were going in the water is because they didn't feel safe on the land. They were afraid they were going to be shot when the person was taking the film, and so they were diving in the water to disappear. Because alligators do that, that's why I will only take one canoe on the Sanibel River. Because there were too many times when I'd have two canoes with me, that alligator would dive in the water right for the canoes. But the one reason why he was doing it was to get on the bottom of the river so he could disappear. And I'd look back at that second canoe, and even though those people said at the beginning of the trip, oh, don't worry about us, we can handle alligators, no problem. I'd look at them, and I thought for sure they were going to roll that canoe over. <laughs> so, and again, if they'd rolled the canoe over, I bet you the alligator would have said, my God, they really are coming after me this time, and would have gotten out of there. <laughs> but the people roll the canoe over, and the guy's standing in the water knowing there's an alligator in there, and he has a heart attack. So, you know, I don't want that to happen, so I only take it in one canoe. Now, I kind of got ahead of myself here and talked about people, you know, complaining about too many alligators. I think this is on an alligator farm somewhere. Uh, you, I counted the number, I think there are 27 alligators in this picture. And lots of times when we do an alligator count, um, we don't even get twice as many alligators as that on the whole island. So I would be extremely surprised if anybody ever had a situation where they had this many alligators in their ponds. Uh, if, if somebody has this many alligators in their pond, I really want you to give me a call sometime. <laughs> this gives you a little bit of an idea of the eye shine that you get at night. And really, I didn't have a whole lot to say about this slide. It just was such a neat picture, I had to put it up there. But I want, to, want everybody to make sure I'm not, this isn't taken on Sanibel. This isn't a situation that's going to occur naturally. This is the most important lesson about the alligators. It is the most dangerous. It is the one we have to worry about the most. It's feeding the alligators. I always say, if alligators were as dangerous as people seem to think they are, just think how many dead tourists we'd have in the state. How many times, as Doug was mentioning, do people come too close to the alligator? About those statistics that Doug mentioned, what scared me the most was out of those 4,000 people during that two-week period that they were looking at it, at the people going through, six people walked over and touched the alligator. Now, that's just, and, you know, this is the hard side of me coming through over the years. The way I would look at it, if that alligator reached over and grabbed hold of somebody that went over and touched them, I tend to say, well, that's natural selection. That person was that person was pretty stupid. He's not supposed to be around very long. But unfortunately, you know what would happen. The community, the state, everybody would say, that's a vicious alligator. We gotta destroy that alligator. And yet that person did something really stupid. I I, I don't think that natural system or anybody should suffer because a human being does something that's not very bright. The reason why it's so dangerous is the same similar problem they have with the bears in Yellowstone. You feed an alligator, I think I've got a picture here, yeah, the alligator's brain is not very large. And it's really small for the, for the power that he can, can put out, for the size of the animal. He just basically reacts to stimuli. And the alligator, you know, there's several sayings, the alligator doesn't know the difference between the hand and the handout. And unfortunately, we all look alike. If an alligator, if, if an alligator got fed out there in the refuge by one of the people here in this room, and we brought him in here and lined all you folks up against the wall, he wouldn't be able to identify and tell who it was that fed him. He'd think all of you had fed him. And that's the problem. 
one person does the feeding and gets that alligator accustomed to the idea that human beings are feeders of food, not potential predators, and he starts approaching all human beings. And some of you may know about the little girl that died last year, when at the beginning of last summer. Uh, she died up around Inglewood. She was killed by a 10-foot alligator on a residential pond. And the media, you know, if you weren't here, you probably heard about it anyway. It made national headlines, national news. The media made a big deal out of how vicious, how much the alligator population was exploding. We've got to do something about keeping these alligators out of residential neighborhoods. And how many times did the media make a big deal out of the fact that there was a grocery store on the lake where that little girl and alligator lived that sold food to the tourists to feed to that alligator? And when the state found out after she had died that people were feeding this alligator, their comment to the press was, we're not going to press charges against the people because we don't want the people to be scapegoats. Well, as far as I'm concerned, one of the major reasons why that little girl died was because people have been feeding that alligator. And that's why I can't stress enough that it has to be a community desire. Charles and the other law enforcement people at the refuge can, they have to be there and witness the feeding. Our police officers have to witness the feeding to really take any action. But I can guarantee it, people keep on, you know, I know they think I'm a radical when I come up with this scenario. But I know, here's the situation, people will look in their own neighborhood or somewhere in a public area and they'll see somebody feeding an alligator and their response will be, oh, I don't want to do anything because I don't want to get in a fight with that person. Well, it's fine, you don't have to get in a fight with them. Call the police. They'll say, oh, but gee, I don't want to take that serious step. Well, here's the way I look at it. If that person walked into their neighborhood and started selling cocaine or some sort of drug to the children of that neighborhood, I bet you the police would be called. Because that would be recognized as a threat to the children of that neighborhood and that community. We have to start looking at the feeding in the same light. Because if you feed an alligator, or if somebody feeds an alligator, they are putting the lives of our children in jeopardy. I used to get really emotional when I saw somebody feeding an alligator, and uh, I used to want to, it, it was everything I could take to keep from walking up behind that person that had just fed that alligator and grabbing hold of him by the seat of the pants and tossing him in on top of the alligator. <laughs> now, somebody on my canoe trip once said, oh no, you don't want to do that, you'll get arrested for feeding alligators. <laughs> but again, I've toned down a little bit now. I used to take it very personal because the way I looked at it, when you fed that alligator, when somebody fed that alligator and turned him into a dangerous animal, that might mean that I have to go and catch that alligator. Every time I wrestle an alligator, there's always a chance I'm going to get hurt. Charles didn't mention it, but he's been chewed up by alligators before. I've been chewed up by alligators. We put our lives on the line every time we deal with an alligator. So I took it personal. I started saying that person is trying to do me bodily harm. And of course, that really wasn't the intent of that person, but that's the end result. Now I look at it, that person is maybe going to kill some cute little little girl, and we don't want that to happen. That's why our program, I to keep these slides moving a little bit, that's why our program has changed a little bit over the years. When it first started, when, the, when uh, George Campbell got the, the program started for, and got the state to give us permits, we basically, whether that alligator had been tamed or not, we caught that alligator and we moved him out of that area, which made the people feel better, and then we moved him somewhere else. But we really tried to stress to the people that, hey, this alligator had to be moved because he was dangerous, he had been fed, and he's probably going to be back in about six months. After little Aaron Glover, the four-year-old girl who had been killed, uh, several citizens on the island started getting very upset, and they came, and, a couple of them came and talked to me and really gave a very good argument. They said, look, we know it's the responsibility of the people, but if somebody has fed an alligator and he's over eight feet and he has tamed and he's potentially dangerous, we are really putting our children's lives in jeopardy. So we, the state actually took away our program for a while, but we have it back. But where it has changed, if an alligator is over eight feet long, particularly, or any alligator over four feet, that shows aggressive behavior and really looks like it's been tamed, we will kill it. 
We had one killed just yesterday because it showed up, it had been caught before under our program it, from the trailer park down on the east end of the island. It showed up there again and when our handler showed up, they dropped a couple of rocks on its nose to try and get it to move and it just sat there. They slipped the noose over its head and didn't even have to use any bait or anything. That alligator was so tame around human beings that, you know, it wasn't frightened of people at all. That alligator was a potentially dangerous alligator, and we really need to protect our children. These are a series of shots of, of what it's all about when we catch an alligator. Now, in the very beginning, in the, under the old program, we used to use bait, because that's what we would get the alligator to come over to. Uh, the state is very nervous about us catching an alligator with bait and then releasing it somewhere. So the only alligators that we can use bait with now is if we're going to kill it, which, again, make, kind of makes sense to me. So what we did here, there was some bread in there. We used fish in some situations. What you do is you, you, you get the bait in there and you work the alligator. If he's really tame, he just comes right over. You throw the bread or the, or the bait, whatever it is, on one side of the noose, and the alligator swims right through the noose. And then you... Then Janie's on the other end of the pole, uh, and I tell her to pull on the line, and she pulls, and we get, this guy was so big, he broke my pole. This was in the early stages of when I was training some of the city employees. I think the first couple I did were a couple of city firemen. They're the ones in the blue uniform. At, Janie and I prefer to work alone. The police department is usually there to help us, but during the training program, we found out one of our biggest problems was crowds. People that we were training that were so involved in helping us that there were a lot of situations I felt I was a little bit in danger because I'm sitting there trying to grab hold of the alligator's mouth, and I've got four or five people standing around me wanting to help. If I needed to get out of the way real fast, it's going to be a bit difficult. So. We prefer to work with just two people. That way, each knows what the other one's doing, and you can get out of the way quickly. You'll see a couple of pictures here. Now, we pull the alligator up onto the land so we can work on him. Usually, he rolls around the line. He gets worn out. He gets tired fairly quickly. You try, if, if, if he's a big enough alligator, you get another rope around him so that you can get him a little bit under better control. Then you get another rope around his snout. Get it shut. It's very easy to hold an alligator's mouth shut. The problem is it's next to impossible to get it open if he doesn't want it. So it's easy. If I've got an alligator, I can, as I've done right there, I've just got a couple of fingers there. I can keep that mouth shut whether those ropes are on there or not. The problem is if my arm was in there and I wanted to need to open it up to get it out, I probably couldn't do that. There's one of the situations that I'm talking about. If, if that alligator had suddenly gone into a roll or suddenly got free, I don't have a whole lot of places I can go. And also, the other guys don't have a whole lot of places they can go. Once we get, get his mouth shut a little bit, then we put a rubber band. I brought a rubber band here with you. People are always surprised. They say, wait a minute, you keep that mouth shut with a rubber band? Well, look, I can show you what it looks like up here. It's actually an inner tube tire from a car. Uh, that's cut in the big strips, and that does a pretty good job. We've got a picture of it. You can see it a little bit right around my hands. You get on his back, you pull him up, and if he tries to go into a roll, you just put a lot of pressure on him, and pretty soon, he, he whether you put a lot of pressure on him or not, if you just keep a gentle pressure on him, he thinks he's tied up. And then, you, then the, usually what happens is Janie's there and right behind me, and she's tying his legs together. That's when she gets whipped in the tail when I'm holding him like that. There you can see the rubber band around this snout. Then, you may see this every once in a while. I've got the canoes on a trailer, but every once in a while I put a ladder on the backside. If he's a big alligator, that ladder works out really well. We use the ladder to get up to osprey nest, but it also works really well to tie the alligator down on. What I always get a kick out of is when I start driving down Periwinkle or the Sandcap Road and the traffic goes by and I look into my side view mirror after the traffic goes by and I try and measure to see how long before the brake lights go screeching on. <laughs> if he's small enough, he's not a real big one, we can just tie him up and throw him in the back of the car. That was something that Janie and I got married. Uh, her son, Joe, was about seven years old at the time. He was, he, he thought it was kind of neat, but I don't think he knew what he was getting in for when uh, he came into my life. Uh, and he, he likes to go with us to catch the alligators, but he was, you know, this little kid, about seven years old, we just went and caught one, 
and I had, we stuck him in the alligator, we tied up in a big ball. Sometimes you put the tail around to the tail and, and carry him that way. And we just set him in the back seat. So he was kind of coiled up like a cat going to sleep, you know, in his chair. You should have seen little Joe. He kept on looking back up over the corner because he was riding in the middle and the alligator was right behind him. He wasn't so sure he liked that situation. <laughs> Now, this is just a special little thing to show some of the community interest that we've got here. And I know this is kind of a gross picture, but people have been calling me up from the Gulf Ridge area for a couple of months, and they said, we've got an alligator over here. He's got a real bad hurt leg. I think it's going to end up being really serious. The animal's going to die. Well, alligators lose their legs all the time in fights or, you know, one thing or another, and they seem to do pretty well. But in this case, the people kept on calling me, and the way I tend to look at it, I usually say, look, if that alligator's going to survive, he's going to survive. It's a tough world out there. If he's not going to survive, then we got another alligator that'll take his place. But the people who were in the neighborhood were so worried about this alligator. You know, they knew this alligator. They watched him in the pond all the time. So they kept on calling me up, and I finally said, all right, we've got a good PR situation. The neighborhood is nervous about this alligator, so we, we're going to go over there, and we'll check it out. It'll be real good PR. And this happened about two months before little Aaron Glover was killed, and, of course, PR went totally the opposite way. But I'm not, we're not really sure what happened. Could have been hit by a car, probably got in a fight with another alligator, but he had multiple compound fractures in the pad in the palm of his hand and that was how swollen that whole leg was solid as a rock it was so damaged and that's his foot you can see the toenail sticking out of the front that's how nasty the tissue was well we had to catch him once and we took some tissue samples to make sure that it was really in bad shape then i had to catch him again now what was in one thing for me what was interesting is this was the first alligator i had to catch after i'd been bit so I was a little bit nervous about dealing with alligators again, but you know, you gotta get back on the horse and ride again once you, when you fall off. So that's what this was. Now, the interesting thing about this, we cut his leg off, uh, stitched it back up. Mark Ely from Crow did a fantastic job right there in the field, and the alligator is doing fine. Now it's moved on, it's not around that pond right now, but I think we'll probably see it again sometime. The interesting note was, after we caught that alligator and cut his leg off, when we checked up on him for the next couple of months, you know, seeing how well, how well he was doing in that pond, he would not let us get anywhere near him. So I figured out we've got a great solution for a nuisance alligator. <laughs> Somebody gets, some alligator gets to be a nuisance alligator, we'll just catch him and cut a leg off. That'll teach him to stay away from people. Then, of course, my other side is, well, what we ought to do is catch the person that's doing the feeding and, you know, what? Uh, now, this is the last slide I've got. You've always got to end the slide program with an interesting uh, slide in there. The important thing is don't get too close to the alligators, especially if females guard the nest. Realize that we have a, a very good city program here. Call the police department if you've got a problem with an alligator. Most importantly, don't feed the alligators. If you see somebody feeding the alligators, be part of the community. And, you know, you can nicely go over and talk to them, but if they really seem like they're doing it, you know, on a regular basis or something like that, call the police. Don't hesitate. You're be, maybe be saving somebody's life. Not just the alligators. Let's not worry about the alligators. Let's worry about the people. You'll be saving somebody's life. And, as the sign mentions, don't go swimming with a bunch of alligators. Thank you.
what uh, what animals prey on alligators? Yes, is that correct? That's right. Just about everything. There's uh, you know, river otters will take the young, and I'm talking about when they're little. When they start to get around four feet long, mostly all they got to worry about are other alligators, and of course man. Uh, but when they're smaller than that, they have to worry about the uh, turtles, fish, birds, great blue herons, great egrets. Uh, Raccoons, just about anything that's going to eat some form of flesh will go after an alligator. Maybe an alligator. Uh, automobiles is something. We've lost three alligators in that curve up there. And you notice the traffic along San Cap Road is almost constant these days. We're, you're going to see some alligator signs go up, hopefully, in the city. That's part of my uh, clout I now have for the city. I said, we need an alligator sign, so we're going to get some gator crossing signs. Fortunately, you'll probably end up on some college student's wall well, in Senegal, the breeding season is variable. I've, I've seen hatchlings in February, I've seen hatchlings in August, September. So, in the warm winter, it's possible for reproduction to occur in February, March, April. And normal season would be, mating season would be May and June hatching in August and September. It's about a 60-day uh, incubation period. But for as far as alligators don't become pregnant, they become gravid. And it takes about 30 days for the eggs to run the gauntlet from the ovaries, become fertilized, become, become celled in albumen, then to be shelled with a calcified shell, and then to that takes about 30 days. Then another 60. Then another 60. I'm thinking about the situation that crops too swamp, where the ponds are practically dried up and the gators seem to be buried in the mud. How long can they put up with that? You mean the, the alligators are, are in the mud yes. with no water right. about them? As long as they're kept. As long as they're moist and their their body doesn't dry, you know the epidermis doesn't become very dry, literally for for months. As long as they're not overheated, and that it, it's a form of uh, reverse hibernation, it's estivation, where they become dormant and just wait for, for habitat conditions to improve. That's built into the alligator's the, the inner part of an alligator's being, the ability to survive those conditions. Okay, the question was, uh, alligators can remain submerged for a prolonged period of time, and how do they do it? Well, like anything else, the, the oxygen, oxygen, oxygen demand is based on the metabolism of the animal. So if the metabolic rate, rate is very reduced, the alligators just sort of become being very quiet, there is no oxygen demand. Therefore, the period he can stay submerged is prolonged. If he's uh, caught on a, on a noose and he's submerged and he's actively trying to escape the noose, then his oxygen demand is greater and he only stays submerged for a few minutes. And it's also based, with, based upon the temperature of the water. If the water is down to 55, 45 degrees, he'll hibernate and stay underwater for weeks at a time. I've seen alligators in the warm season stay under as long as 20 minutes <coughs> now. Marshall once. Marshall got hit by a car and we had to go in and check on him. We joked about the time when he beat up on the car because the car ended up worse than he was. <laughs> and we went in and we saw him and he sunk. And we sat there and waited for half an hour. And then he surfaced about three feet away from us, looking right at him. And you feel the canoe start to vibrate. And Steve Phillips, the Natural Conservation Foundation, and I would say, <coughs> we weren't so sure how bad he was going to be. But he just sat there and looked at us for a couple of seconds. We kind of checked him over. He had a few scratches <coughs> on his back, and then he sank and disappeared. Yeah. You talk about their distance and length and all. What about their age? How long do these you things know, live? Generally, 65 would be, you know, 65, 70, somewhere around in there. I don't know if there is a longevity. I think the max published age is 
about 55 years, yeah. That old flowers book on longevity, I think. And do they have a sense of smell? Yes, they do. Very good sense of smell. That's one thing you have to be a bit careful about. We had one where the alligator, you know, it was one of these situations where the, the screen did porch was flat on the ground and it was probably not more than 25 feet away from the mosquito ditch. And the people were renters, so they didn't really know what they were just kind of living here temporarily. And they set their garbage in, in bags, paper bags, or something like that, right there at the corner, real close. And they were all frightened because the alligators were coming along and sticking their nose through the screen in fence to get the garbage. When all they did was start putting them in a garbage can and, and didn't put their garbage out until a little bit later, which they probably should have done for raccoon. When they quit putting the garbage out there, the alligators were coming around. Yeah, you got it. times do I think have I had to He came at me was because halfway across the fairway he saw the lake. 
And he said, I'm getting out of here. That's what I'm saying. So that's why he came out. Two questions. The question is that we describe two, two sounds, the grunting sound and the hissing sound, and the question is, do they make additional sounds and do they communicate? In the springtime, the bull alligator, the male alligator, when he becomes sexually active, he begins to patrol certain areas where he will find and has found in the past receptive females, he will go into a new area and bellow like, a, like an enraged bull. I cannot mimic it. I always say that Jane says I do it, but I don't know if that is. To me, it always sounds a little bit like they don't have them much anymore because most motorcycles have electric starts. You know, the old type motorcycle that you kick and it won't start, so it's kind of a. Probably break the skin. There's no bite at that early age. 
the idea, people think that an alligator that's in the surf has got to be sick. You hear that all the time. Something's got to be wrong with it. I'm always amazed that human beings don't think it's strange at all for them to go into the room, put on a swimsuit, and go swimming. Human beings are land creatures. What are they doing in the water? But yet an alligator that everybody knows is freshwater creature, if he goes in the salt water, he's got to be sick. Something's wrong with him. People have a tendency to pigeonhole things. They want things to be exactly this way and not any other way. But they all know human beings do all sorts of crazy things they're not supposed to be doing. Okay, we'll take uh, one or two of the most uh, additional questions, and then I'll turn it back to yeah, I think Doug wants to go home. <laughs> yeah, right here in the front. It's a, it's a, right. It's a, they, they will they will exhale to submerge. They're retaining enough oxygen to do the job when they are submerged. They don't. They're not like a submarine. They don't uh, take in water to, to you know eliminate the buoyancy. Yeah, but are you positive that they exhale before they go under? Mm -hmm. Not always, okay. but they do. If you're ever, that brings up one thing, if you're ever around somewhere and you see the alligator sink and then you see the bubbles coming up behind, that's not air bubble that, that the alligator's putting out. It's just all the gases that are in the vegetation on the bottom. But that's how you can tell where the alligator is. If the alligator sinks and starts going along, you know he's just a little bit in front of those bubbles. But those bubbles are going to slowly come to the surface as he's swimming along. He doesn't know he's doing it, but that's me. I'll thank you all for coming tonight on behalf of myself and Bird and turn it back to Doug. Let's give these guys a one. Thank you. I certainly did not want to, to uh, end the program and the particularly questions. We've had excellent questions and they'll be incorporated in our, our publication someday to help other visitors learn more about alligators. Have, uh, three things I'd like to mention briefly, and then you're invited to come up and look at the skull, the scoot, and um, pick up some information if you'd like it. First of all, uh, I do have copies of the alligator study that was published by the Ding Darling Wildlife Society in their fall newsletter last year, if anybody would like to see that. Secondly, I'd like to remind you that this coming Saturday is our big wildlife uh, week celebration down at the Tarpon Bay Recreation Area at the end of Tarpon Bay Road. There'll be five other live examples of predators there from predatory plankton and uh, mollusks to a burrowing owl. And these are injured uh, raptors that uh, are, are in an educational program. Burrowing owl, an osprey, and a bald eagle. Later that afternoon, at 1 o'clock and at 3 o'clock at the Refuge Visitor Center, Refuge Manager Todd Logan will be presenting a program about the Florida panther. He is the Refuge Manager of the new refuge, uh, Florida Pan Panther National Wildlife Refuge, and a very interesting speaker. So if you can get to that, uh, it would be worth your while. Thirdly, in Sanibel, it is the style to help uh, Move the chairs off to the side, so if you would, Sanibel style, give us some assistance and come out and talk to Charles and Mark. Thank you for coming.